Um, but the first part that I'd like to talk about is the PGP at um, Massey University that we've entered into. It's a, it's a seven year project. We're about two years in, so we have done a lot of the establishment phases now. Um, and the, the, whole, the whole direction of it is, is to test a range of um, cultivars and um, seed lines that have been selected that we think will yield high value honey in the future. And we're reasonably confident because we have done preliminary work on them as well. So suitability, what's the risk about moving seed lines, cultivars around? What's the optimum planting densities? Um, do we need to use fertiliser? What about establishment, weed spray and all that sort of thing? And going forward, there's more problems, or well, not problems, uh, opportunities really. Um, what sort of plants do we need to plant as well to, to provide pollen supply? on these um, plantations. Really, when we finish a plantation, we want to be able to walk away and say, OK, that's going to yield manuka honey, but I can also leave 200 hives in there permanently. I don't need to truck my hives around. Um, that's the ultimate as far as we're concerned. And there are, there are beekeepers that have been doing this for a, quite a period. Um, there's one large beekeeper who runs an awful lot of hives. and. Traditionally, what he's done is on his apiary sites, he has put small blocks of um, plant species um, that do yield pollen at different times. So the, the problem can be solved. However, in different areas of New Zealand, you need different solutions. Right, so this is the first one. Um, right, this, this, it's all conceptual stuff, OK? So, so you, you need to um, understand that when the bees harvest manuka nectar, um, the chemical that provides UMF, like the unique manuka factor, isn't actually in the nectar. Um, there's a precursor chemical in the nectar. All right, so the more, more of the precursor nectar, uh, chemical in the nectar that you have, the better manuka honey you're gonna get in the long run. So obviously the breeding program is driven towards high value UMF honey, so we, we want manuka cultivars that will produce lots of that chemical and then have lots of that chemical in their nectar so when the bees harvest it and turn the nectar into honey in the a ripening stage in the hive, um, we've got lots of the precursor in the very early stage honey. And as the honey matures, the precursor drops away and if you just look at the red line and the blue line, um, they, that's an ageing profile for those honeys um, of, of that sort of potential. And, Precursor, the red line drops away slowly over time and the blue one goes up and peaks and then it actually starts to drop away when the honey gets very, very mature. Um, that's just a simple management issue for us and we make sure that we don't market honey that we know is going to go into the drop down zone. But uh, the more of the precursor, dihydroxyacetone is the chemical, it's DHA is the short form. Um, the more DHA in the nectar, the better the honey will be. And you're dealing with a number of problems with plantation establishment. How long does it take the manuka to get up to size and flowering? Um, what sort of other nectar sources can the bees work? How much of the other sources will they get rather than the manuka nectar? All of, all of, these, uh, all of these conditions really affect how rapidly your plantation will develop and how quickly you can expect to get a decent manuka honey off. So, I put that one in, it's, in a, it's coming out in a new food processing book. It's, um, it's the most important thing for this discussion today is it's the amount of dihydroxyacetone in the nectar that drives the quality of the manuka honey in the future as it matures. <coughs> right, now, here's some historic data, okay? Not all, like, well, not all manuka is the same, all right? There's an enormous amount of diversity in the manuka or the Leptospernum scoparium genus in New Zealand. There's a lot of what you could call regional varieties out there in the field and not all of them have the same potential. And this is very nicely illustrated here by two groups of regions, okay? Um, the regional code just tells me where it came from and Historically, in 2011, 2012, so that's spring 2011 going into summer 2012, 
um, that is how those two regions behaved, all right? So depending on the purity of the sample and that the, the x-axis along the bottom really gives you floral dilution. Floral dilution happens in the field. The bees will work other honey, so you always get a degree of floral dilution. It's very hard to get 100% manuka honey. Um, but you can see the red line up the top. That region produces very good manuka honey. The um, variety of Leptospermum scoparium that grows there is, um, provides elevated value manuka honey. And therefore, the line is steeper. So a, 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 a honey that's like 90% pure has around 5,000 milligrams per kilo dihydroxyacetone in it when it's very, very fresh. So it's got lots of potential for UMF to grow in that honey. So it's a good honey. Whereas the blue line is um, two regions that the, the Leptospermum scoparium varieties are actually quite closely linked genetically in those two regions. And a, a, a honey that's virtually pure, it, it never has 5,000, 2,500, 2,800 milligrams per kilo dihydroxyacetone. So it just doesn't have the, uh, the potential to generate a very high activity UMF honey, even though it is pure, you know, pretty monofloral honey. So it's high grade manuka, but it just doesn't have enough of that chemical. And it's uh, most probably genetically linked. But there is um, there's some evidence that there is some environmental influence as well. But that's kind of what the PGP's looking at. Is, is it environmental, genetic? Personally, I think it's probably genetic, and that's what I say to them. They, they're not convinced yet, and they will continue to examine it. And obviously, it's an independent research. Yeah, hi. Uh, questions at the end, or I skip over? Uh, well, you can ask one now. I just wonder, if I'm not asking you the name. No, no, I can't. Name. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering in my mind with your research, how you how you determine a region. Sorry, not really Oh no, I do it. I do. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Like one, two, no. three, four, eight, twelve. Yeah. I um. How do you quantify region? Originally, I did it geographically, but now I'm more inclined to do it by morphology, like the plant, because the plants are quite. The plants, the, the varieties themselves are quite geographically isolated. They will, you do get areas where there's um, interbreeding around the boundaries, but genetically the core regions are quite distinct morphologically as well. So look, I, I, I can tell, like, I can tell where a plant came from by like its leaf form and its flower shape and size. I, I've I've researched it for about 12 years now, I suppose. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, but you can do it geographically as well, but you, 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 you've got to watch out for um, border areas where you get a bit of interbreeding and you don't really want to go into there because the data that you get out will be a bit messy. But if you go into the core areas and get the honeys from there and the plants and do the... Um, take nectars off them and examine them compared to how the honeys behave and all that, um, then you can isolate c core regions. So that's kind of why... Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry, ca carry on. Um, okay, so like this year, th and this, this is all about plantation going in the long run. So this year, um, we, I, I asked for um, honeys from... Uh, regions 14 and 19, they're drum samples. Good, good quality manuka, it's not too bad. Oh, the, the, the ones that came out of um, region 14 were a bit blendy, I wasn't that happy about them. There might be some better ones <coughs> later on, but that's the data I've got at the moment. And the important point is that the 2012-13 season, the year later, the, the honeys from those two regions sit on that line. That's how the honey from that area behaves. It's it always it always sits in there. Now, um, interestingly, here's a plantation that we've got developed. It's reasonably large, well not that large, but reasonable size um, plantation that we've got in region region 14, 
where I've used um, seed line material from region three to nine, uh, three to seven, I think it is, in there. And you see that they are, um, they, the, the honey is behaving like um, that, that region. It's behaving better than what you'd expect from that area. So that implies that it's a genetic influence, all right? So that plantation's three years old, um, so there's not enough manuka plant material there to provide monofloral honeys. Um, so you can see often the bees are straying onto other things, other plant species. But there's, the honeys are, when, when the manuka bushes plants grow bigger and the bees can get more nectar off them, the honey is going to be like um, a top grade manuka. So we're very pleased about that sort of result. That implies that the program is going to work <coughs> going forward. Um, it's, it's early days, but actually I, I, I'm quite pleased that we got a reasonable harvest after three years, and it will only improve as the plants get bigger. And here's some ideas on values. Um, if, if you look down the left hand side, if you look at a wild bush sort of pasture honey, if you store manuka honey, I showed you ageing curves, an ageing curve before, it, it ages, it produces um, more UMF as the honey matures basically. It's a chemical reaction that occurs in the honey. Um, but if you, if you age a bush honey, it doesn't accrue value at all. It, like, it just stays at $8 a kilo. Um, it, it really doesn't accrue value. Um, oh. if, if, if you age a, a fairly average sort of manuka honey, it'll go from about $15 to $25. If you age a very good plantation manuka honey, that's got quite a bit of dihydroxyacetone, it'll go from $15 to $40 odd dollars a kilo in 18 months. It makes a real difference to beekeepers' income and also landowners' income. Um, so there's, there's two things, there's oh, two main points. You've got to get the right variety in the right place and you need to know how to treat the honey to get the maximum value out of it. Um, and if you, can do, if you do that, then you can really capitalise on the manuka bubble that is in the Asian, particularly in the Asian markets at the moment. Um, we've hardly scratched the surface of the Chinese market um, um, at the moment, we, we're struggling to supply it. We, we need more supply. There's a huge market over there. And you don't necessarily have to use um, varieties. You can easily use um, some of the cultivars that we've bred. That's um, 28014, it's the best one that came out of that cross number. Um, you can see the amount of nectar that thing produces. It's um, it's pretty good because the red, first red bar is normalised dihydroxyacetone content per sugar unit, normalised to sugar. Uh, it's up around, I think, 14,000 milligrams per kilo. It's really got some potential, all right? But the... the same environment? Yeah, 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 common garden experiment. But the point is about that data there is that's a common garden, but I want to see how those behave in the field. And that's why we've gone to the PGP. Sorry, I'd elevation and mm. elevation sign and wind yeah. direction. Yeah. And yeah, we're doing a full set of glasshouse work and really mucking around with environments like that, as well as doing a set of field trials in very different areas of New Zealand, of the North Island of New Zealand, um, exposing the same set of cultivars, and I, that one's in it. Um, same set of cultivars and seed lines to those environments and the same set of plants is also going into the glasshouse work. So by the time that's finished we'll know whether that will perform in wherever because you, you can't, oops, <laughs> you, you, can't um, you can't risk planting it if it's not going to perform in my opinion. Anyway so there's real potential in the program, heaps of potential. Right, um, nearly over to Barry. Um, <clears throat> right, so we have set up plantations. Um, to give you an idea of growth, um, this one's in the central North Island. 
One year they, they were plug plants about that high when they went in. One year they'd established, five years later they're uh, two and a half, three metres tall. Um, but we need more data. We, we need to know how quickly do the plantations replace the existing flowering vegetation? What um, microfire, uh, microclimate changes are made by the plantation? I mean, the bees don't like exposed areas. They, they, they need cover to fly, and someone brought it up earlier on. Um, all of these things will most probably improve how a plantation behaves. And of course, if we get the right variety in the right place at the right density, there's no doubt we can increase the hive stocking rate per hectare.